gentlemen, it's pleased to be a social series. I'm Andy Katz, pleased to be joined by the NCAA Chief Medical Officer, Brian Hainline, Dr. Stephanie Chu, who is the team physician from the University of Colorado and also a member of the NCAA Coronavirus Advisory Panel, and Shane Lyon, Athletic Director at West Virginia and also the Chair of the Division I Football Oversight Committee. All right, a lot to get to here in our weekly series, and this virus obviously is changing hourly, daily. Uh, I want to start with you, Dr. Heemeyer, because we put out at the NCAA, and you were a big part of this, obviously, a chart that is really hitting on social media because it's eye-opening. It is where we thought we would be, where we hoped we would be, and essentially where we are. Uh, and the scale where we thought we'd be at this point in mid-July, getting toward late July, was cleaned down. Uh, but where we are is a problem. Uh, so with that being said, um, how has that changed? And I know we're going to get to the new socialization um, based recommendation, but how has that changed your mindset when you saw where we are where you thought we would be? Well, thanks for that, Andy. You, you, you know, we made our plans we've been really thinking about the fall the summer and and we just expected that there would be an ongoing continued downward trajectory of, of new infections and it just has shifted so dramatically in the past month in a way that no one uh, could have imagined and so we knew that some states were opening up uh, a bit quickly and when you go back to the original document of opening up america again there were really several assumptions in that document about a national surveillance program and oversight of testing and contact tracing. And, and that hasn't happened. And, you know, when you open up very quickly, uh, you're, you're not really understanding that this is a highly contagious virus. And there, you know, the immunity of the population is, is really quite low. And, and so in retrospect, it's not that surprising when you open up way too quickly and people are indoors and, and, and small gatherings and large gatherings that you're going to have a lot of new infections. But, you know, it's caused everyone to rethink not just sport, but school, society. I mean, we obviously, for public health reasons, need to open up as a society because that has ramifications otherwise. But you know, and, and, and sport is part of that. It's a healthy part of society. So it's just been very disappointing and, and it's caused an awful lot of collaborative thinking in terms of how can we continue to consider this as, as a possibility. So, yeah, it was a major reset in our thinking and, and, and I think it will continue to be over the next several weeks as we follow this trajectory. I want to get your reaction, Dr. Chu, and then Shane, because both of you have been on with us before at a different point during this pandemic where I think we had a little bit higher level of optimism. Uh, when you saw that chart, Dr. Chu, what was your reaction? You know, it, it kind of matched, uh, like Dr. Hainline had said, um, what is what is happening in um, the United States in terms of opening things up and um, and just seeing what that looked like um, and, um, and not having universal masking being um, out there. Um, and I think we see it in our athletic campuses, you know, um, our students have come back and, um, our students are, you know, um, properly socially distancing within our facilities, but then they go and they gather with their teammates in outside places and they don't properly socially distance there and they don't wear masks. And, um, so it, it kind of matches what, what we're seeing in, um, in the communities that we're seeing in our athletic departments. Shane. Well, no one said it was going to be easy, um, but no, I, you know, I think, you know, you'd ask a month ago, you know, about this. I, I felt that, you know, a lot of optimism that we could play, you know, football come September. Um, you know, it's trending as we all talked about in the wrong direction, but I think many of us, Andy, you know, we're, we're not willing to give up on this. You know, we have many student athletes that, you know, have worked very hard for this time of their life and they have a lot of hopes and dreams. And, you know, as an athletic director, that that's what I provide is the hopes and dreams and the ability to compete. And, you know, I, I still think that we have some time to make some decisions. Uh, as Dr. Chu and Dr. Hainline talked about, there's, you know, protocols that we're putting in place, you know, are you know, across the country wearing the mass social distancing, those type of campaigns. And seeing in the next couple of weeks, you know, where this where all this goes from, a, you know, hopefully a decline 
in the number of cases and, and gives us a little bit more hope, you know, to play fall sports. All right. So I want to first direct uh, our viewers that you can certainly read the entire document on all our, our social media platforms, NCAA.org, all our you know social media in terms of Twitter uh, and Facebook. You can certainly find the entire document. But I want to cherry pick, obviously, a couple of these. Um, first of all, uh, Dr. Hanlon, I'll start with you when we go around here. One of the key things that jumped out to me was the 72-hour window to make sure that you could get tested before competition, 72 hours before. Now, we're in July, and you know, we're hearing stories from across the country where it's very difficult to get that fast test. Uh, I go back to talking to, uh, I think it was Alabama Athletic Director Greg Byrne was telling me he heard by June they were going to have that saliva test where you should get it like that. That hasn't happened that quickly. Uh, so you know, to get that kind of a standard, we're at 72 hours before competition, what are the chances by September we would have that? Well, good question, because that's another uh, disappointment is the testing infrastructure in, in, in this country. There's not a, a national oversight of that. And, and we're seeing different sorts of tests that are, 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 are popping up here and there. And, and even when you look at the professional sports, some are using salivary based testing, some are using nasal swabs. So it, and, and there's no question there's a big delay right now. I mean, it, it, it can take sometimes over seven days to get a test result. So 72 hours is what many medical groups that were weighed in on this document thought was the bare minimum. And so this is the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine, the advisory group, the National Medical uh, Association, our internal competitive safeguards group, uh, and the Autonomy Five Medical Advisory Group. So we all thought that that needed to be the window. We also put a clause in there that there will undoubtedly be new or emerging testing technologies. And so that may be the answer for how we can get around that because we, we simply can't say, okay, we're going to give up on the 72 hours. In fact, at the end of the document, we provide a number of bullet points for what really would be a reason to discontinue sport. And, and so we have to really be mindful of that. It's not just inability to test properly. It's inability to contact trace properly. And, and, and we really have to have local healthcare infrastructure that's intact. So, so I think we'll be able to get there. There are still are, um, emerging point of care technologies that are, that are really, um, I, I think being produced rapidly. So I'm, I'm reasonably confident that we'll be able to make that 72 hour mark. Uh, Dr. Chu, um, another thing that jumped out at me was the masking, you know, everyone on the sideline. And, you know, the way I read it, this was all sports in the fall. And if we're just dealing with fall sports right now. Let's deal with one hurdle at a time. Winter we can deal on another show. So let's just deal with fall sports here. Um, but then it says when you come to talk to your coach that you have to mask. Explain how you think that can be done where whether it's football, soccer, field hockey, you tell me um, how you go from the field of play practice and then communicating with your coach and masking during that comp uh, communication before going back out onto the field of play. So I know that um, with football in particular, there's um, shields that um, are being developed and are out there that will fit over a helmet. So that protects um, and it goes down, you know, to the bottom of the helmet um, over the eyes. So that will can serve as um, a mask um, when you come off the field of play. Net gaiters for other fall sports, you know, we've been using a lot of net gaiters. Um, if you look um, online, there are there are uh, pictures um, online of soccer players in other countries that. Um, years in the past few years, so prior to COVID, um, have had neck gaiters on when they're um, practicing and before they um, before they kind of come onto the um, pitch, so to speak. So, you know, neck gaiters are something easy that can be worn and then pulled up and then pulled back down um, when they when they get out, um, when they come over toward their coaches and speak to their coaches. And it is mainly a protection. You know, our coaches are probably more vulnerable um, they are more vulnerable than our athletic population. And so I think that that was an important thing that we felt needed to be put into the document um, to show that protection um, for our coaching staff. So Shane, let's take it from a cost perspective because in your day job, you're an athletic director at West Virginia. Um, 
the fa- the the shields that Dr. Chu was talking about. Uh, what kind of expense was that for athletic departments to make sure that all football helmets have that capability? Yeah, we started exploring that early in the summer, actually, Andy. And, you know, we wear shut helmets. And early on, it wasn't very expensive. I, I think that originally they were around a $15, $16 cost. Uh, since that time, there's some shields that are also made that would fit, you know, uniform to any helmet that's less than $5. Um, it, maybe it's only a couple of dollars. So, you know, I think the, the helmet manufacturers, you know, understand the need for these shields and the protection, not only of college athletes, but of high school and youth sports, et cetera. So they, they made the cost, you know, relatively cheap to be able to use. And they're very manageable to put take on and take off uh, in case there is any type of injuries that's sustained by the student athletes. So, you know, it's it's relatively inexpensive and, and something that, you know, I'm hearing that, that we're going to use here at West Virginia and many institutions across the country will use those as well. Um, and I don't know if you know the answer to this, but how are they in inclement weather, you know, whether it's rain, mud, fog, you know, uh, dealing with the shield? Yeah, I, you know, again, we, we're in the process. We're, we're not in helmets yet to determine that, but I've been told that they've used some of these in lacrosse over the summer. Uh, and is very similar type of helmet and the shield that goes on. And what, what we've been told is it doesn't fog up. It doesn't, you know, really get dirty, all that. So, you know, there, there's still a lot of, you know, work to be looked at with it, but we do feel that it's a, a valuable uh, protection piece that we're going to use as an institution. And, and hopefully, you know, the, the, the previous eye shields only have been out there and we haven't had problems. So the lower half the mask, and we feel won't have problems either. You know, another thing that I thought was kind of fascinating that I think we could see years to come from now, uh, if college football coaches buy into this, was the breakdown of how you should use your team. You know, first, first, um, the first team versus the third, second versus the fourth, to separate your first string quarterback, you know, hypothetically for, from your second string, so that if there is an infection, an outbreak, you can basically just take that group of players, pull them out, slide in another group without necessarily having a massive drop off. Uh, and I want to start with you, Shane, as the football oversight committee, how much buy-in do you think there will be from coaches to adopt that and adapt to where that's the way they're going to practice uh, for the foreseeable future to ensure that they can make sure they can put out a team on the field? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great point, Andy. And, you know, I think our coaches have, have worked through the AFCA, through their coaches association, through Todd Barry, and talked about this. It's like, how can we play the game of football and with contact tracing out there, not lose the entire team if somebody happens to test positive? And they, ha- they have come up with the different pod systems and, and ones versus three and two versus four. So as we've seen in the past, the normal practices are not going to look the same. So there's going to be different practice sessions for different units and your, you know, your, your quarterbacks aren't going to all be working at one time together as they have in the past. You're going to be splitting them up. You're going to split some of your offense alignment, defense alignment. So the practices that we've seen in the past are going to look a lot different just as a result of the health and safety and then being able to, you know, play football on Saturdays. Dr. Aylan, Dr. Chu, um, in the other fall sports, uh, soccer, field hockey, we'll get to volleyball in a moment, but how feasible is that to split your practice and your teams when you don't have the numbers that they have in football to where you would try to have your first string versus your third and second versus fourth? And we'll start with you, Dr. Haline, and then Dr. Chu. I mean, you obviously have less people, you know, but I think we really have to be imaginative about this because it all is about contact tracing. And so when there is a positive case, the contact tracer who is overseen by the local public health authority, they're going to see who has had sustained or intense contact risk. And so, you know, we just have to figure it out. And and, and in soccer, even uh, certain things that are done in soccer, the amount of time that that's spent in the corner and, uh, you know, the celebrations that are just so much a part of the sport, all of that is is really going to have to shift. But but it's with the contact tracing in mind. That's that's the key. Dr. Chu? 
And I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I mean, I think that um, speaking with my coaches and speaking with the changes and, um, you know, that everybody wants to play sports in the fall. So I think that they can be imaginative and they can reinvent how to do practices um, so that they don't wipe out a whole section of the team um, in one fell swoop so that we can continue to play with um, with the, a, a seemingly normal team um, if we do get a positive case and we have to take out a subset. So I think coaches um, are going to need to understand that and um, and kind of roll with um, what's going on so that we can have a, a season for these athletes. Shane, the officials, mm -hmm. uh, the recommendation is electronic whistles uh, to limit, obviously, uh, the droplets coming from blowing it. Um, so how would that work, and what's the buy-in from the educating community? Yeah, we've had some discussions with uh, Steve Shaw that, that oversees the officials from a national basis, and I have not seen one actually uh, work as it shows, but it's a handheld device that, you know, they can squeeze when they, they need to or push a button when they need to blow a whistle, as opposed to you saying, Andy, you know, blowing and have droplets. So, you know, there's things that we have to do with the, the officials as we're going with the student athletes for the health and safety of them as well. And, you know, what I'm being told, you know, through Steve Shaw is those whistles are definitely something that is as is, is effective as a, a regular whistle that to be able to officiate the game. Uh, they'll be tested as well, you know, to be as part of the protocols and, and they'll have to say, have the safety measures. And what we've looked at is, you know, the football field will become that nucleus that all those individuals are you know, on that field are tested, you know, prior, as Dr. Hainline talked about, the 72 hours, you know, in advance. And then we know that at that time they, they were uh, uh, a negative of any uh, viruses. So, you know, it, that's what we're trying to protect and, and take extra measure steps, you know, as we officiate and look at the game. You know, as you look at the way you guys broke down the sports, Dr. Hainline, low, medium, and high, and in the main fall sports, most of them are in the high group. Uh, the only one in the medium is cross country, but in the high is field hockey, soccer, football, and volleyball. And I want you to address this if you could, please. Volleyball is the only one of these that's played indoors that is in the fall. So how does volleyball factor into this because of it being indoors? All right, so one section of our document, and, and this is where the, the CDC, who, who helped us uh, go over this as well, they did a review, and they asked us to put a section just on ventilation. And they said, look, outdoors is the best if you can be outdoors. Next is indoors with good ventilation, and finally indoors without ventilation. So as we learn more about this virus, we understand that there may be a risk in, in, in an indoor space that's not well ventilated if people are are really close to one another. And and also, you know, you look at the culture of volleyball. It's just, I mean, it's kind of hard to imagine playing volleyball without a high five and a bump after every single point. So that has to shift as well. So, but the indoor consideration is is, is really important. And so we have to think about that going forward as we move into winter sports as well. So Dr. Chu, um, and I want to go around the horn here on this in that, um, you know, we're seeing all these different conferences decide to play either no fall sports or just conference play because they can pull it. Um, these are recommendations. Um, what's, the, what's the viewpoint of the coronavirus advisory panel in terms of making sure that every conference, every school adheres to these or realistically probably not going to be able to play if they cannot at least meet these standards? Um, I think that uh, it is... Um, uh, Meeting the standards is a health concern. Um, it's for the health and safety of the athletes. And so I think as a team physician, and I think team physicians across the country um, will adhere to the standards that are set. And, and I think that having a guideline is what is um, most important here. Um, not, um, not having a guideline um, is um, then you're kind of left out there to imagine things and figure things out on your own. And I think that um, having these guidelines set in place and having kind of a standard set in place so that we all feel that we're all playing on the same um, playing field um, is uh, is important. And I think that that's where um, so the conferences came in and said, we're going to play 
only our conference because I feel that a lot of the schools, you know, in the conference that I work in and um, they felt that then, you know, we can kind of monitor things. The other thing that can, comes into play is then you have less competitions and you have less travel um, and uh, you have a little bit more time. So um, most of those non-conference games come at the beginning of the season. And so we can kind of make sure that um, we kind of see where everything is and we have competitions that are safe for our student athletes. Dr. Hayline, I, I get so frustrated when people assume that uh, this is run like a professional organization. We know it is not. There are state schools, private schools. Every state has their own deal going on right now with masking. Please help us. Help educate why your recommendations, and this is not an order, like a law that has to be followed by every school in the country. Right. Well, so it is a membership organization. We're a representative democracy. So that, that's very important to understand. And, and the reason why this wouldn't be passed as legislation, which is a cumbersome process, is because the rules of engagement might be different two weeks from now even. But but if you look at the process of this document and the number of, of groups that were consulted and putting this together, and then we considerably socialized this with the membership, D1, D2, and D3. So really everyone signed off on it. And you know the way to look at this is, okay, this document's out there. It's that we call it recommendations or you can call it a best practice. And so it's not binding, but I think it would be really, really difficult uh, to not follow the guidance that is there. And 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 so and in essence, we've we've created a national standard as as recommendations, but I think it's pretty well understood by the membership, especially with the, the amount of buy-in that we got, that this is the way to go. All right, Shane, I'm gonna go ahead and give you the last word because uh you are definitely someone who is a glass half full. I want your optimism here. We all need it. Uh we're in the middle of July. These practices have started. Uh, so tell me your level of optimism in terms of, you know, whether or not we're going to have college football, which is obviously the main thing we're waiting to find out on in the fall uh, and when maybe that decision would have to be made. Well, I think we have to remain optimistic as we move, you know, we move forward. You know, Andy, if you look a month ago when we originally talked, there was high optimism that we're going to play football. A month later, now there's a a lot of pessimists out there that we're not going to play football. So we're looking, you know, August 15th, what's it going to look like? So I think it's baby steps as we take the, the, the steps forward here and be patient and, and look at it. And, you know, I feel like we're entering that, you know, the fourth quarter of a football game and we're down by three touchdowns. You're not going to give up. So, you know, my analogy is we're going to keep fighting back, fighting back, and hopefully, you know, come uh, late August that, we're going to throw that Hail Mary to, to end up winning the, the, the football contest at the end of the fourth quarter. So, you know, there, there's still room and time to, to make decisions. And, you know, each conference, each uh, institution is going to have to make their own decisions based on where they're at. But as a whole, as a football oversight committee, and what we're trying to do is be patient, work with the conferences, and hopefully uh, in a month from now, we'll, we'll be in a new place for, from the virus and the spread of the virus. Well, look, we can only hope because it was, we were in a different place a month ago, two months ago, three months ago, four months ago. Hopefully, we're going to be in a better place a month from now. We all want it to come back, obviously, safely. Uh, I urge everyone, of course, to read this document at ncaa.org and all our NCAA social media handles, certainly on Twitter and Facebook. For Dr. Brian Hainline, Dr. Stephanie Chu, Shane Lyons, I'm Andy Katz. Thanks for watching every week our NCAA social series. You can go to ncaa.org slash social series. They are archived there. Believe it or not, we're on week 17. And we're going to keep going throughout the course of the year, hopefully with better news ahead. Thanks for watching, everyone. Stay safe.